it's a delight to be with all of you today. I'm only sorry if we can't be doing it in person. I think this year's UNESCO Most Winter School has a most remarkably apt and apposite title, Citizenship and Responsibility in a World of Uncertainty. And I've elected therefore to offer what I have to say this morning within that framework. What I'm going to be speaking to you about are the challenges of citizenship and specifically the responsibilities that each one of you as citizens have a remarkable year while the pandemic is still wreaking havoc around much of the world. The world in terms of the condition we find it in is like most other years, a mixture. Firstly, many things have improved greatly. There is far less famine, far less war, less early death, and all indicators in terms of lifespan, maternal and child mortality, war, terrorism, and civil conflict suggest that we are much better off. Vaccination levels have risen. Basic education is at a high historic literacy levels the same. Extreme poverty has fallen dramatically, although the pandemic is driving at least 100 and possibly 150 million people who had escaped poverty back into it this year. But as I think all of us realize, we're at a very precarious moment in history. We find ourselves perched on the edge, uncertain as to how we should build forward better. Before the pandemic, it was quite clear already that there were eight trends which were going to shape the way in which the world played out over the course of the decade. There was a shifting center of economic gravity from the Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific, a weakening of US power projection, a disruption of the rules-based international order on many different levels, and as a consequence, geopolitical tensions and contestation of regional security landscapes in at least three parts of the world, between the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Asia, in the Russian sphere of influence, and in the East China and South China seas. All of that was exacerbated by what is often called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, but what is in reality the first biodigital technological revolution. It's not very industrial and it's rather different to anything that has preceded it. That is going to enhance and increase the level of significant social disruption within our societies. And we've seen already the extent to which it has weakened national governance. All of this is occurring against the backdrop of a growing, increasingly urbanized humanity pushing up against planetary boundaries in all spheres of humanity's embeddedness in the Earth system. When we did scenarios at the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic was upon us, we saw three broad possibilities. A scenario called islands, where the United States and China were two poles seeking to divide the world as it were in allegiance between them. An ideal scenario of constructive equilibrium where we realized that the threat of polarized separation would bring so much damage and disaster that we managed to reconfigure our understanding of how to share the world. And a scenario that we called archipelagos where the European Union disturbed by the phenomenon of islands, of Chinese-US polarity, would seek to engage with ASEAN in Southeast Asia and possibly India, Japan, and other actors in order to try to bridge the gap. Then COVID struck. And if we're realistic, this pandemic has engendered a recession on a scale not seen since World War II. If you look at the graph from the IMF, the data mapper from October 2020, just down below, you'll see that the dip in 2020 
is far deeper than anything that we have experienced in the last 50 or 60 years. The pandemic has also overburdened governments and put exceptional pressure on central banks and international financial institutions. It's exposed the fragility of corporate balance sheets and caused corporate liquidations across the world. It's induced extraordinary psychological and social stress and financial hardship in most communities. And worse still, it has widened social and economic disparity in all. It's also sparked a storm of information and disinformation through traditional and social media. And so, seen from another perspective, we are remarkably close to an edge. How did we get here? I think it's important to understand that the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991 set in place a series of events which produced a cascading effect. Firstly, perhaps on the positive side, it consolidated the liberal rules-based international order premised on the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, by which I mean, of course, the World Bank Group and the IMF and the World Trade Organization. It saw the opening of national economic borders to free flows of goods, capital, and people, the last through travel, tourism, and legal immigration. It led to a flood of economic opportunity. And the two cliches of the 90s were globalization and Thomas Friedman's famous flat world. China's progressive integration into this order saw about 2 billion people lifted from abject poverty and brought to at least some degree into the modern global economy. But liberalization of capital flows, enabling investment offshore in emerging markets by major companies from the advanced economies, especially in the United States, cost jobs for lower skilled US workers and enabled extraordinary levels of tax arbitrage by multinationals. This, of course, led to the Asian financial crisis of 1997, which saw debt to GDP ratios rise to 180% of GDP and was followed almost immediately by the Russian and then broader emerging markets financial crisis of 1998, where inflation in Russia reached 84%. Capital became extremely scared in emerging markets. And there was a flight to safety back into New York, London, Zurich, Frankfurt, and Paris. After 1999, after the flight to safety had taken place, there was a reconsolidation of Western influence in major Western capitals. And the globalization of Western media, advertising, and entertainment provoked resentment around much of the world. This was the era when CNN, Sky, and BBC were universal features of broadcasting in every landscape. Advertising agencies became global. Public relations companies became global. This resentment was seized on in parts of the Muslim Ummah to justify jihad, spawning the Islamist and jihadist movements that we've seen over the course of the past 20 years. And of course, right in the middle of this, right at the beginning, just as the money was sloshing around in New York and London, the dot-com bubble burst. Immediately after that, in 2000, we had 9-11 take place in 2001, when jihadists flew planes into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. The immediate response of the Federal Reserve was the liberalization of financial regulation. This permitted the emergence of new hedging and derivative instruments and produced a financial economy many times larger than the real economy. As only certain people had access to the instruments of the financial economy, this dramatically widened the inequality of both income and wealth. Central bank stimuli which were intended to offset the political and macroeconomic shocks by driving down interest rates to encourage spending and undertaking quantitative easing to make it easier for the economies to continue functioning, encouraged financial institutions to take higher leverage 
and increased corporate and sovereign vulnerability. It also accentuated the volatile flows of portfolio capital in and out of the capital markets of emerging economies. And that led to the global financial crisis out of a very simple crisis in the US subprime mortgage market in 2007, leading eventually to the collapse of Neyman Brothers in 2008 and the global financial and economic crisis with which we're all familiar. 10 years later, in 2019, when we were writing global trends for that year, it was actually in October, we said, and I quote, six years after the end of the global recession, which ran effectively from 2008 to 2014, the global economy will see growth of only 3% in 2019, the lowest since 2008, 2009. Despite a strong recovery in capital markets, fiscal and corporate over-indebtedness, low and negative interest rates, slower manufacturing activity and global trade, higher tariffs and policy uncertainty and slowing investment pose vulnerabilities throughout the system. And we predicted that a highly disruptive global recession will follow within a few years. I emphasize this was in October before anyone had heard of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. But then of course, SARS-CoV-2 struck. And as of yesterday, <clears throat> there were 108,545,000 global cases and about 2.4 million deaths around the world. Interestingly, of course, those deaths are distributed in strange ways as a result of the incompetence of the US response under Mr. Trump, the United States leads the world in respect of the number of recorded deaths, followed now, however, by Brazil and Mexico ahead of India which has a population far larger than either, and then the United Kingdom and Italy, countries whose health systems one would have imagined would have been well prepared to be able to deal with these particular challenges. And as vaccines are now part of the discussion that we have on every level, it's worthwhile noting that as The Economist said on the 6th of February, we have nine vaccines in various stages of preparation. And the fact that we could do this in one year has been quite remarkable. But then, as The Economist said, it's one thing to design and test vaccines. It's quite another to make them at sufficient scale to generate the billions of doses needed to vaccinate the world's population. So let's take a quick look at the economic impact. This is the IMF's report in January 2021 in their World Economic Outlook. If you look at the column for 2020, you'll see that world output, instead of growing by 3%, as it was expected to do before the pandemic, has in fact contracted by 3.5%. The contraction in the advanced economies has been nearly 5%, 4.9%. In the US, it was 3.4%. And in the euro area, over twice that, at a contraction of 7.2%. Emerging markets and developing economies, overall a contraction of 2.4% with a much lower base, of course. China is one of the very few countries in the world to have a positive growth rate, albeit a much reduced one in 2020. It grew at 2.3%. India contracted by 8%. And the ASEAN 5, the so-called Asian tigers of an earlier age, contracted by 3.7%. The recoveries off those low bases projected for 2021 are 5.5% in the world at large, which will not bring us back to the trend line from 2019. But the interesting thing in terms of the United States and the euro area is that the United States having contracted by 3.4% is expected to expand by 5.1% whereas the euro area is only expected to expand by 4.2% after a contraction of 7.2%. As you can see, China and India are the stars of the recovery in emerging markets and developing economies. And vaccine availability is a significant part of what is intended to enable this recovery. 
But if you glance at the parts of the world that are either red or pink on this map, you'll see that with the exceptions of countries like Peru and Brazil and Indonesia and other parts of the ASEAN region, the vast majority of the developing world is suffering from extreme deficits in respect of the availability of vaccines. And that has consequences because the unbridled nationalism that has been associated with the availability of vaccines is causing serious harm. As the Director General of the World Health Organization said on the 18th of January to his executive board, as the first vaccines are deployed, the promise of equitable access is at serious risk. 39 million doses of vaccine have been administered in at least 49 higher income countries. Just 25 doses have been given in one lowest income country. Not 25 million, not 25,000, just 25. And then he used language that you almost never hear in multilateral organizations. I need to be blunt, he said. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with the lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. A few days later, in a working paper by the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States, it was pointed out that actually it's worse than that. In the most extreme scenario, where wealthy nations are fully vaccinated by mid-2021 and poor countries are largely shut out, the global economy would see lost output of $9 trillion in 2021. That, just for reference, is greater than the GDP of Japan plus Germany. And 50% of that cost would be borne by the advanced economies. Even in the most likely scenario, where developing countries vaccinate half of their populations by the end of 2021, the global economy would see lost output of somewhere between 1.8 and 3.8 trillion. And once again, more than 50% of this cost would be borne by the advanced economies. So vaccine nationalism by rich states is actually shooting themselves in the feet. But all of this is playing out against the backdrop of what has been condensed to be the threat of climate, the threat of extreme weather, the threat of landing on a path that will take us beyond 1.5 degrees of global warming and make it impossible for much of humanity to be able to survive in the manner with which they're familiar. This is true. And we have to address that matter with extreme urgency. As someone else that you'll have the opportunity of hearing from, Dan Brooks has already pointed out very successfully in a rather splendid book, there is a direct relationship between warming climate and the transmission of infectious disease through new vectors. But even as we address climate, we have to recognize that oceans and biodiversity and everything related to global freshwater use and land system change and the loading of nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, all of these factors play into the workings of one Earth system of which the human species is but a part. This is an enormous challenge and it is past time for us to be able to address it successfully. Broadly, as the ancient Greeks knew very well, hubris always produces nemesis. And our failure to deliver effective democracy or effective multilateral governance over the past two decades is what has led us to this crisis today. We weakened national governments by prioritizing global financial and supply chain efficiencies and subordinating global welfare and the health of the earth system, the biosphere, to the economy. Citizens are upset, nativistic populism and class revolt have arisen and are not surprised. They're all sharpened by conspiracy theories fueled by digital disinformation. And this brings us to what you have to do about it. We have to square the circle. We have to solve this problem if we are to preserve government of the people, for the people, by the people, and restore our ability to act collectively at the necessary scales to advance well-being, 
protect against disasters, and live within planetary boundaries. Now, how are we going to do that? If you look under Jefferson's picture on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see that I've also cited Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Fichte, and Hegel. The reason for that is Jefferson was not a phenomenon on his own. He was fundamentally part of Enlightenment thought. Having said that, let's have a look at what he said in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, and listen carefully to this paragraph, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. The other two paragraphs are in fact a justification for revolution, a justification for insurrection. That is where the United States was vis-a-vis -vis Georgian Britain of George III at that point in time. And the purpose of the Declaration of Independence is to provide a justification, go to the last paragraph, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them, that's the people, under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. But my purpose today is not to encourage you to insurrection, it's to encourage you to understand that the whole of the European Enlightenment was premised on the proposition that all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is the meaning of citizenship. And what we need today is a new order that is founded on those underlying principles. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if one thinks about it, are actually simulacra for what we would think of today as well-being. And well-being, I'm going to argue, is impossible without equity, security, and sustainability. So let's look at a few simple propositions. The first is that the sole purpose of government the only reason for its existence is to secure and advance the well-being of the citizens. And sovereign citizens, as Jefferson said, must demand this of their governments, because in reality, these governments derive their legitimacy from the consent of the governed. Therefore, envisioning a future of equity, which just means fairness and justice, of equity, security, and sustainability, and defining the pathways to getting there, and using the roughly $15 trillion in funds that have been printed thus far and will have to be monetized through debt to recover from this recession in order to create an equitable, secure, and sustainable world is the task of this age. I'm going to talk about how it can be done through institutional means, but please recognize that my core proposition is that you all, we all, as citizens, bear the responsibility for achieving this outcome. Institutionally, we can frame the system through the United Nations General Assembly after the United Nations Secretary General has reported to the assembly under resolution 75-1 before the end of the 75th session. They have required the secretary general to report on how to, in effect, as Mr. Biden says in Washington nowadays, build back better. I say, we're not building back, we're building forward. So build forward better. We can also frame the system through the mechanism of the presidency of the Italians in the G20 in 2021. So let's look in closing at what that would mean. 
The United Nations Secretary General will report to the 75th session with recommendations, and I quote from Resolution 75.1, to advance the common agenda of humankind and respond to present and future challenges which are interconnected and require reinvigorated multilateralism. The General Assembly will undoubtedly debate the Secretary General's report and after debate and possible amendment, adopt it. The G20 process that I've described as operating in parallel, the G20 represents 90% of the global world product. That is GDP on a global level, 90% of global GDP. 80% of world trade, two thirds of the population of the world and half of the land area of the world. There are two channels through which this needs to be advanced. The so-called engagement groups, which include B20, which is Business 20, Cities 20, Labor 20, Science 20, Think Tank 20, Urban 20, Women 20, and Youth 20. These spend the year thinking about what to propose to the G20 heads of state and government about how to address the challenge. If we could use it to frame well-being in the context of equity, security, and sustainability, the challenge would then be how to build a new system premised on those foundations and embed that in both national and international instruments. And in parallel, Ministerial groups from all governments in the G20 across all of the portfolios of government meet, and they should be required as well how to embed equity, security, and sustainability into their portfolios in the circumstances of their own societies and economies. That would enable the foreign ministers then to draft a communique and the heads of state and government to adopt it. I want to close just by re-emphasizing your responsibility as citizens. I called this little talk the challenge and responsibility of citizenship in 2021, and I've cited at length, but I'm going to cite again Jefferson. We hold these thing, truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal, and that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In an updated format, I'm calling that equity, security, and sustainability. The second point is that this is not just the responsibility of governments, because as Jefferson in the context of the Enlightenment pointed out very clearly, to secure these rights, to enable the well-being of the citizens, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. So it was ever true that we get the governments we deserve, but you as active and informed citizens at this point in history must ensure that you accept the responsibilities of citizenship and ensure that the governments whose legitimacy depends on your consent and whose function it is to ensure the well-being of all citizens address these challenges efficiently and in a comprehensive manner. Thank you very much. I hope the discussions that follow are worthwhile and I much look forward to seeing the impacts of your activity.